Good morning. Let me congratulate you all on being here so bright and early. I predicted at least half of the group would forget to get a show up at 9 o'clock. It looks so like most of you are here. Today I want to discuss what is probably the heart of the coal utilization program for the present anyhow, namely the liquefaction of coal for fuel oil purposes and the hydrodesulfurization at the same time. Today we will talk about the liquefaction processes and tomorrow, or rather this afternoon, uh, discuss in detail the desulfurization. I have a feeling personally that the liquefaction of coal may be one of the first applications that is finally made of the utilization of coal because by liquefying coal to a fuel that would be suitable for public utility use, one could relieve considerably the amount of petroleum and natural gas that's now used in public utilities. I think the figures are that around 55% of the public utility power is now from coal already, so this would be an addition 45% or some two or 300 million tons of coal per year. Even this figure is frightening when we consider the difficulties of mining coal that we're, conflict we're confronted with these days. Uh, as you can see here in lecture number five, I've briefly summarized the history of coal liquefaction. I'm sure we all realize that it's not a new process. As a matter of fact, the Germans did a very good job with coal liquefaction, even to the point of refining the liquid to produce gasoline, even aviation gasoline. However, the 12 plants that they built during the war operating at pressures of about 10,000 PSI have all been dismantled. Uh, according to one article I read, several of them have been reconstructed in East Germany, Siberia, and Czechoslovakia, but uh, all of those that are operating in Germany have been dismantled. Likewise, the one in Britain, in Billingham, which got up to 150,000 tons per year uh, was, I think, dismantled or at least operation is stopped. The total German production was up to 4 million tons per year, uh, including 100,000 barrels per day of high quality aviation and auto gasoline. So one is working with a process that has been made to work. Incidentally, I noted down here that pressures, while well, a 10,000 pounds in Germany, of course, it was up to 700 atmospheres. Pressures have been run as high as 1,700 atmospheres, according to the article I read in some of the Russian plants. This is going a little bit in the opposite direction to the current trend where we're trying to drop the pressures down to three or 4,000 PSI. Now, two outstanding processes come up for discussion in connection with this coal liquefaction. The one, the Synthoil process developed with the Bureau of Mines, the other, the H process developed with the Hydrocarbons Research Incorporated. So I want to go through these in some detail so as to get as clear an idea as one can from descriptive material as to what the plants amount to. Perhaps some of you in the audience have visited or gone through the experimental plants at Bureau of Mines, and if so, in the discussion, you can add a lot of details that aren't apparent from just a cursory discussion. The layout of the plant is shown, I think, in the first transparency. Uh, there's several items I want to point out here. I don't know the details of how the coal is made up and slurried to begin with. I don't know the details with respect to the temperature at which this is done. And I'm curious because in my notes, as you will notice down at the bottom of page one, I have not only the poor volume of the catalyst that's being used, which is a cobalt and aluminum catalyst supported on alumina. The alumina is stabilized by silica, but also Believe it or not, we have the surface area. 
as I looked over my notes this morning, this struck me for the first time that the surface area is included in some of the specifications. Oh, I am off track. The surface area of the catalyst is all right. I thought first it was the surface area of the coal, but the surface area of the catalyst is just a convenient term. And you will notice that the surface area goes up to the order of two or 300 square meters per gram with a pore volume of somewhere around 5 tenths cc. Uh, just to digress for a moment, we discussed methods for measuring pore distribution, but we've said nothing at all so far about the importance of pore distribution in catalytic reactions. Now, catalysis has gotten to the point at which one tailor makes pore distributions to suit the occasion. And ordinarily, for liquefied, for liquid reactions, reactions occurring in the liquid phase, it is recognized that the pores have to be considerably larger than they do for reactions in which gas phase reactions can take place. For example, catalytic cracking occurring over zeolite catalysts, believe it or not, takes place in spite of the fact that the openings to the chambers in which the active sites are located are only about nine angstrom units in size. This is a gas phase reaction. If one were working in a liquid phase, the diffusion down these capillaries would be very small, and consequently, one would want to go to larger capillaries. So it is interesting here to note that the catalysts have average pore sizes of somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 80 angstrom units. Uh, right offhand, one would think that this might be a little bit on the small side for liquid phase work. But on the other hand, one balances the total surface area that's available, the surface area being larger, of course, uh, for the smaller average pore size. One has to balance the surface area available against the pore distribution. If you make the pores too big, you cut down so much on the surface area that you don't have enough surface for the catalytic reaction to occur. So this is a compromise, but it's a compromise that one has to pay attention to whenever he makes a catalyst. And as I say in general, the pore size should tend to be on the high side for systems in which one is dealing with liquids rather than gases. The operating conditions for the unit here are quite mild in the sense that the pressure is only in the range of 3,000 to 4,000 PSI compared to the 10,000 that was used in the German plants. Temperature of around 450 degrees centigrade. Uh, I don't know the temperature at which the coal and vehicle are mixed, probably the order of hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit, but uh, this mixture is pumped in through a preheater then into a reactor. Now, the critical part of this process is that the reactor is filled with a fixed bed of cobalt moly hydrodesulfurization catalyst. The particle size is given as 1 8 inch pellets. So one has a bed of pellets through which a slurry of coal with oil that is obtained as one of the products of the reaction is circulated with hydrogen at very high space velocity. <clears throat> the space velocity becomes important because the high rate of flow tends to clean the catalyst, keep carbon deposits off. In fact, the wonder is that there's any catalyst left when you get through passing liquid with hydrogen at such high space velocities through the catalyst. The linear rate of flow here is listed as around six feet per second. The time of contact is a little indefinite, but it's somewhere in the order of a minute or uh, less. So at very high space velocity, with lots of turbulence, sufficient turbulence to keep the material in good contact with the catalyst, and also to presumably remove the catalyst, the carbon from the catalyst, uh, this process is carried out. So this reactor, as I say, is a packed bed reactor. Uh, the details are not too clear. I don't 
I thought that the catalyst was packed in tubes about an inch in diameter, and this perhaps does represent the passage through a series of these tubes. I'm not absolutely sure of this. But I do know that it is a packed bed with a very high velocity circulation through it. Then beyond this, one has the usual high pressure containers going down to low pressure containers, and the separation of ash, extra solid material, and so forth and purification of gases. The gas formation is not very large. Most of the material is converted into liquid, and something in the order of 95% conversion is obtained. Uh, in one of the articles written by Yavorsky from the Bureau of Mines, who's apparently the guiding light in this work, and incidentally, one of the people at the University of Pittsburgh pointed out that Yavorsky was their prize chemical engineering student a few years back. So they're quite proud of the place that he's made for himself in the Bureau of Mines, being apparently in charge of all of this coal liquefaction work. Uh, he summarizes in one of his articles the advantages of this liquid phase process compared to methanation processes in which one is going to produce synthetic natural gas. The first and perhaps one of the more important aspects is the fact that the hydrogen consumption is kept to a minimum. You remember the slide we had yesterday showing the carbon-hydrogen composition is about one carbon per nine-tenths hydrogen in the original coal, something of the sort, nine-tenths carbon to eight-tenths carbon. If one goes clear up to methane, one has to increase that from one to one one carbon to four hydrogens. In other words, the hydrogens from eight tenths or nine tenths per carbon up to four. In going to coal liquefaction to form a fuel oil that is suitable for consumption in power plants, the change is only from nine tenths to 1.1. An analysis, of course, shows that considerable hydrogen consumption also takes place to remove oxygen, to remove nitrogen, to remove sulfur. But the actual change, so far as the carbon-hydrogen ratio is concerned in the incorporated product, goes up only from a 9 tenths value for hydrogen per carbon to a 1.1 value. <coughs> Secondly, he points out the mild operating conditions. Now, these are mild compared to the temperatures involved in the combustion or gasification process we mentioned yesterday, in which rather high temperatures are involved. Energy conversion efficiency is 78% versus 60%. I hope in the discussion some of you can explain exactly what is meant by these energy conversion figures. In the brief time that I've had to look through the papers that have been published, I failed to find these calculations, but uh, they must exist somewhere. And uh, I assume that this refers to the fact that there are fewer chemical processes going on and going strictly to the liquefaction of coal, then going through all of the various processes leading up to and culminating in the formation of methane. But uh, I don't really know the details as to how this calculation is made, but high conversion efficiencies are certainly to be favored, so uh, we can take this as one of the advantages. Uh, then the question comes up in regard to storage of product. He makes a point of the fact that one can store liquefied fuel oil very much more readily than you can store huge quantities of natural gas. I'm not sure how much of a problem this is because right at the moment it looks as though one wouldn't be storing anything very long if it were available. It would be a welcome addition to all of the power plants in this part of the country and probably in most parts of the country. Uh, more economically pipelined, I'll take his word for this, pumping liquid per unit weight of material apparently is a more economical business than pumping uh, gas. And we know that pipelines are used for pumping oil and all sorts of things. All of which reminds me, just to digress for a moment, uh, I was impressed by the pumping of different liquids through pipes and the changing from one liquid to the other. But the fact that some companies, I think Standard Oil of California is one of them, are using radioactive tracer materials to mark the interval 
between the two pipelines, between the two types of fluid. In other words, when they're ready to change from one fluid to the other, they put in a little organic radioactive material that will act as a tracer. And at the other end of the pipeline, they simply have to watch for this tag to come along, and they switch from one product to another. So liquid pipelining is quite easy. Uh, less water requirements. I presume all of this is true. There certainly is no water required so far as the actual reaction is concerned if one is using hydrogen. Uh, we'll get to the question of using carbon dioxide and water uh, a little bit later. But uh, if one is using hydrogen and going straight to fuel oil except for cooling processes, there would be relatively little water consumed. There's none of it chemically consumed. Now, the heart of this process, as you can imagine, is the catalyst. And those of you that are interested in this business of liquefying coal, doubtless they have given some thought to the question of producing better and superior catalysts for a process such as a centaur process. It perhaps becomes a little discouraging to look at a recent paper by Yavorsky in which he recounts the results that he obtained in an attempt to produce a better catalyst. Somewhere down this pile, I have the paper that he published. And the essence of it is that it's difficult to improve on a cracking, on a catalyst of this type. Uh, I don't find the paper right here at the moment, but uh, the summary is given here on the page that will include most of the items. To begin with, they had three or four catalysts made by a commercial company. I think it was Harshaw in this case. These catalysts contained two to three percent cobalt and about 10 percent molybdenum on a fairly, fairly high surface area silica stabilized alumina. This catalyst, if one wanted to be very brief, proved to be the best catalyst tried so far as the removal of sulfur from the coal is concerned. Attempts were made to produce single phase catalysts, including iron, tin, nickel, cobalt, or molybdenum on alumina supports. They even varied the alumina supports in line with this pore distribution thing I was talking about, from large pore sizes to small pore sizes, from small surface areas to large surface areas. But in no case were they able to get a catalyst that was superior to the standard cobalt molly catalyst that was purchased commercially. They even tried several very bizarre combinations that one might expect to be active. Uh, they found, for example, that tin tended to be a good catalyst for, dis for disintegrating the coal, in other words, converting the coal to oil, but a poor catalyst for taking the sulfur out. So they tried combinations of tin and molybdenum, and even tin and cobalt and molybdenum, hoping that the combination would perform both jobs with superior results. But in no case did they find a catalyst that was better than the cobalt molly catalyst. So from all of this, we can draw the conclusion that it's possible, <clears throat> we still have to admit that it's possible to improve the activity of these cobalt molly catalysts. I think a number of things still may remain to be tried, but it is not going to be an easy job. So most of the pilot plants that I know anything about that are being planned in connection with the H process or the Centaur process plan to go ahead and utilize the catalysts that are now available, namely the standard cobalt molly catalyst. This is a very interesting problem if you reflect on it for a minute. Why cobalt and why molybdenum? Why out of all of the catalysts does cobalt molly come out to be the best? This is a question that still isn't answered. We're going to discuss it some this afternoon in connection with the theoretical work that's been done on cobalt molly catalysts. But it is not at all clear why the choice. The only other material that's used in place of cobalt material is nickel. And nickel is a little less effective for removing sulfur, but a little more effective in removing nitrogen. This is particularly true in heavy residual oils in which there's considerable nitrogen content that has to be taken out before the material can be used for 
crashing to gasoline. And Gulf Oil Company has put quite a bit of time in developing a so-called Nicomo catalyst, which is a combination of nickel and cobalt. But aside from these, there's very little work done to indicate any superior performance of other catalysts. The molybdenum can be replaced by tungsten, of course, and one would have a choice of cobalt, nickel, or iron, perhaps, for the other component. But uh, these catalysts have had their place and do have their places, but the cobalt moly catalyst turns out to be the best one for the job. So we have a process here in which one can obtain 95% conversion, I believe is claimed, of the coal to a liquid phase, the remaining being mostly ash with a little bit of carbon. And the sulfur removal drops sulfur down from, well, in, I think, I see, I see, we have data, I believe, in the next transparency. <coughs> This is, as indicated from a Kentucky coal, as I recall, 4.6% is the original sulfur in feed. And the final sulfur in the product oil on an ash-free basis, 0.19%. You will note, however, that, well, you won't note because I didn't put it down here, but uh, a large fraction of this coal, if I recall, 3% of the sulfur is iron pyrites. So it's an extra large amount of inorganic material, but nevertheless, the remaining 1.6% organic sulfur is pulled down to this 0.19%. So that the product obtained is well within the limits that are put out by the air pollution group for total sulfur content that would be going out the stacks if one burned this particular fuel oil uh, with a sulfur content of 0.19. I think if the sulfur content is down below 1%, as a matter of fact, it will pass specifications. Well, these are the other characteristics of the product, depending on whether they're asphaltines or benzene soluble or asphalt or acetone soluble and so forth. But uh, I don't think I'll need to go into that. The heating value is high. The viscosity is in a reasonable range. So that all in all, the product obtained is a very suitable one. So much for the synthoil process. Uh, we've only touched it hurriedly, but uh, this is about all one can do. I find that most of the papers written by Yavorsky and his co-workers do just about the kind of a job that I've done here, namely just hit the high spots. I haven't found a detailed discussion yet of the things such as the temperature of which the slurry is prepared and uh, many of the details of operation. But uh, those probably will come along later. Many of them are being changed. The process is in the, well, the whole procedure is being changed and modified and improved. I think the latest statement is that there is a pilot plant proposed, financed. I'm not sure what the status is any more than I know the status of all of the coal money. But uh, I know that a pilot plant on a large scale is being planned for this, but what the last word is, whether it's actually under construction. Uh, I think I read that it was under construction, as a matter of fact, so perhaps the power plant is assured. I thought at one time we might be going down here, but apparently it's not so. Anyhow, so much for the synthoil process of the Bureau of Mines. Now the H coal process, listed on page two, is very similar to the centaur process, with the one exception that a slurried bed, a ebullating bed, a boiling bed, a fluidized bed of lick in the liquid phase is used rather than a fixed bed. <laughs> this is claimed by the proponents of the H. Cole process to be an advantage, to permit more flexibility, to permit catalysts, for example, to be drained off continually. You could take a 1% or a 10th percent or whatever you want fraction of the circulating catalyst out any time the one wished. I think we have a sketch of the reactor, as a matter of fact. This is the reactor in which 
All of this outside here is a emulating bed, catalyst material going on up the top, and recirculation down through the center tube. Somewhere there is a catalyst outlet. One can draw out, in other words, a fraction of catalyst any time one wishes and replace the catalyst uh, at the point at which one puts in solid and liquid. So it has a great deal of flexibility, therefore, in the sense that if the catalyst tends to be poisoned, uh, one can replace it. If for any reason it becomes less effective, it can be replaced. Incidentally, one thing I forgot to mention are just some rumors that I hear, but I think are probably substantiated. You never find in any of the published papers on the synthoil process that there are any difficulties involved. But the two rumors that I have heard that certainly need straightening out are that when you run it for a few weeks or a few months, the circulating oil medium becomes too viscous and the plant freezes up. Now, if some of you have been in contact with them, you probably know the straight of this better than I do, but I do know they have had trouble with the increased viscosity during operation. This could probably mean that the catalyst is a little less effective and is not breaking the material down to quite such low molecular weights as it was when it is fresh. And this would be a, clearly a drawback of a centaur process in the sense that you can't take out a bit of the catalyst and bring it back up to its initial fresh activity by adding catalyst as you can in the H process. Uh, if this becomes a serious problem, clearly something would have to be done about it, either by the rate of circulation, or the temperature of operation, the pressure, or something to bring the operating conditions up to the point at which the oil that's being used in circulation will have a correct viscosity, which probably means will be hydrogenated over the catalyst down to a material of a molecular weight corresponding to the low viscosity. Uh, I hear also some stories about the catalyst losing its activity. Perhaps these are related because I think they blame the higher viscosity on the loss in activity of the catalyst. So certainly a pilot plant is advised before a large plant would be constructed and uh, there just may be some odds and ends to be straightened out in the synthol process uh, before it can be very successful in a large pilot plant. Uh, I have the data down here for this h coal process operation. <clears throat> the heart of the thing is a reactor, so I didn't bother to show the sketch of the rest of the apparatus. The coal slurry is used, is hydrogenated at 850 degrees with 2,700 PSI. The synthol process goes up as high as 4,000 PSI. I'm not sure what their optimum pressure is. The catalyst is identical except for the fact that it is, I believe, smaller particle. I don't have down the particle size, but I think it is a smaller particle size. Incidentally, in any liquid phase system, one thing that is pretty well established is that most of the reaction is going on in the outer portion of the catalyst. The contribution of the pores, particularly pores that are down 80 angstrom, 60 angstrom holes, is just necessarily going to be limited. Consequently, the most effective liquid phase hydrogenation process that one could use in principle would be one in which the particles, the external diameter of the particles is as small as possible because the external surface area of the particles is a thing that usually comes into play, particularly in materials operating in liquids and also materials in which gunk of one kind or another, polymerized material, coke or whatnot, can fill up pores one may have to rely on the outer portion of the catalyst particles for most of the activity. Therefore, the slurry proposition, I mean the uh, ebulating bed, would afford a possibility of using smaller particle sizes. I neglected to copy down the particle size, so I don't know exactly what they are, but I think they would be smaller than the eighth inch pellets that are used in the synthol process. There's inherent flexibility in the ebulating bed in the sense that you can change the space velocity rather easily, you can change operating conditions, and so you can operate 
to produce a rather heavy fuel oil, but you can also operate to produce a cracking oil that is of the right uh, composition, molecular weight, and so forth to be used for a cracking process to go on and perform gasoline. So one of the points that they claim in favor of the H process is the flexibility by which you can operate it one day at one condition, another time, and with a few changes, you can go more nearly to the lighter liquids and thus have quite a bit of flexibility. Again, they claim around 95% conversion. The pilot plant stage is one that I wouldn't pretend to know anything about. Any articles that you read on this are six months to a year old, and uh, this is out of date so far as pilot plants are concerned, but they have operated up, according to my notes here, to an eight ton per day pilot plant, and uh, they are planning a 250 ton per day. What the status of that planning is, I don't know, but it's probably being worked on. Sulfur content is given as cutting down to uh, 1900s for synth synthetic crude. I believe I have a slide, I mean a transparency showing the product formed in one or two or three of these typical runs. Uh, this is a distribution of the product formed. The total conversions you'll notice are up between 90 and 95 percent. The heating values of the oil are pretty high. This one's a bit on the low side. Uh, I don't have the sulfur noted down on this slide, but I do have the figures here in the table to indicate that a figure of 1900 is obtained if you operate under conditions that give you the synthetic crude, in other words, the uh, lower molecular weight material, the more severely cracked material, uh, compared to 4300s in the fuel oil. This simply means that the more severe the conditions of operating, the more you had to desulfurize in the process of producing the conversion from coal to the product. I think this is all that we need to say about the H coal process. The H coal process, I should add, is an outgrowth of the H oil process. The H oil process is one that was developed by the Hydrocarbons Research Incorporated a number of years ago to work on high molecular weight crudes and particularly petroleum residues and the like for converting it into lower molecular weight material. So it's pretty much an outgrowth of the procedures that were used at that time. Now there are a few other processes that should be mentioned. The console process, Consolidated Coal Company, uh, has a solvent. Now these temperatures I hope are Fahrenheit. I am negligent for not having put the indicator down. But I believe that the uh, crushing and solvent mixing are made carried out up to 650 degrees Fahrenheit. It's interesting to know which this is because if coals have surface area, the exposure to solvents at temperatures at which they still retain their high surface area could be of considerable interest and might be different from exposure at somewhat higher temperatures. The operating region is somewhere in the range of 650 to 735. Again, I think this must be Fahrenheit. With 70% of the coal extracted, the remaining ash will have sulfur in it and will have to be used in various ways. It could be used as a source of hydrogen, which the, the sulfur could be taken out, or it could be converted into gas in various, in various other ways. The oil product obtained in the consolidated process is finally hydrogenated up to 3,000 PSI at 835 degrees Fahrenheit. The original articles, the ones I've read in the various summaries here, indicate zinc chloride is being used as a catalyst, but there's also some indication that other hydrodesulfurization catalysts are used. Zinc chloride will not be as effective for removing sulfur as cobalt moly catalyst, so far as the desulfurization is concerned. It may be even more effective in breaking up the coal material into low molecular weight material. Incidentally, one thing I should mention in connection with all of these processes, uh, the old problem of bringing coal particles of whatever size they happen to be into contact with a catalyst, which is a solid. 
Now, aside from the peculiar experiments of the type that I mentioned in regard to Terry Baker's work in which it has shown that particles on graphite can be made to chase themselves all around in circles and move all over the surface of the graphite during combustion, except for that rather bizarre behavior, we have no known means by which solid particles deposited, we'll say, in contact with coal could have anything to do with the activity at a distance from that particle. Unless the coal material can be dissolved or vaporized or broken up somehow so that molecules can travel to the catalyst. If one is working with zinc chloride, there is always a compensating effect that zinc chloride has a considerable vapor pressure. And so zinc chloride molecules could diffuse into the tiniest capillaries and thus bring the catalyst in contact with the coal material. But for these fluidized, for the H process or for the synthol process, either one, in which one is depending on the organic material being brought to the catalyst, one has to look to the question of the average molecular weight of the coal particles in the dissolved material. I think the usual feeling is that these have molecular weights of no more than about a thousand. It certainly wouldn't help much if you simply had colloidal particles of carbon carried through the oil and sitting down on the catalyst. This would still give a very low contact area between the catalyst particles and the coal particles. What is necessary is that one gets the coal degraded to a molecular form in which it will be in position to uh, react with the catalyst by being brought directly in contact with the catalyst. Now, the other factor that comes in is a question I mentioned yesterday of hydrogen donors. Uh, so far as I know, the synthol process and the H process <coughs> do not make any deliberate attempt to add tetralin. This is my impression. Now, many of the molecules, however, in the oil may be those capable of picking up hydrogen and passing it on. They could be hyd hydrogen donors. So this is a separate procedure and mechanism by which hydrogen may get transferred to coal particles, to coal chemicals, and thus help in the formation of the final product. Uh, the extent to which each of those is utilized, I think, is not straightened out. It's one of the things that would have to be worked out in detail. Incidentally, when I'm talking about coal particles, uh, I'm sure you all read the article by the Syracuse group, the September 2nd, Kim and Engineering News, page 16. I just happened to look it up, so I remember the reference. Uh, in which the claim is made that by adding various liquids to coal, the coal disintegrates right in front of you into material down the order of 30 mesh or something of this material, something this size. And so disintegrating, it separates out the iron pyrites and the ash from the main coal particles. Looks like a very decent way of possibly separating iron pyrites out and the ash content out from the coal and thus making somewhat of a large reduction in the sulfur even before you take any organic sulfur out. Uh, I was at Reno at the Bureau of Mines a week or so ago, a couple of weeks ago, and one of the men had read this and of course wouldn't be satisfied until he went and got a piece of bituminous coal put in a beaker and poured, anthrax, poured methanol on it. And sure enough, the coal disintegrated right in front of him. Uh, I was at the W.R. Grace Laboratory, and the boys got curious when I told them about it. The only coal I had around was anthracite. And anthracite does not disintegrate in front of your face. In fact, for half an hour, there was no apparent change in the anthracite. And then by reading the article in detail, we found that anthracite reacts much more slowly. The other thing of interest in connection with this methanol business, <coughs> you think I'm harping on this too much, perhaps I am, but uh, the figure given is 100 pounds of methanol for a ton of coal as being the amount that's necessary for the disintegration. Of course, most of this could be recovered. I think 99% of it could be recovered. So the net cost might be one pound of methanol per ton of coal or something of the sort, so far as the cost of materials are concerned. But the part I was interested in is that 100 pounds of methanol will come out again within a factor of two of being in one molecular layer on the surface of the coals in which it would be poured. And this would be a reasonable thing if one 
is going to depend on a liquid phase by surface tension action or something of the sort, separating the coal where it hangs together in little chunks, separating it into smaller particles. If one is going to depend on a liquid phase to do this, then you have to add enough material so that when it vaporizes and covers the surface, uh, there's still, I mean, this is a step that will take place before you have much liquid left. The material will tend to vaporize and adsorb all over the surface. So it's reasonable that the amount that you would have to have would be something in the order of enough of a vaporizable material to cover an entire monolayer before you get this excess critical amount of liquid that's necessary to pull these particles apart. This is just an aside, but it's related to a possible factor that could be important in pre-treating coals of the future for processes even such as the synthol and the H process. It seems to me it would be an advantage to get the ash content and the iron priorities out, though this would be debatable because maybe these things are acting as catalysts. You see, I've talked about the cobalt molecatalyst, but I'll, we always have to keep in mind that the ash content, particularly the iron from the iron priorities that is there, could easily also be a catalyst for action right on the coal particles even before they dissolve and get transport, transported onto the uh, cobalt molecatalyst. Well, somewhere down here I have, I think, a list of the status of all these processes. I'm sure you're all acquainted with this Oak Ridge National Laboratory TM4298. One thing I remember it for is it gives an excellent summary. As of September 1973, of the status of these various processes we're talking about. process is mentioned here, uh, with a process development unit in operation and a 250-ton plant proposed. It even gives the difficulties that are related to the project. Solid separation of unreacted coal, production of hydrogen for the process, because this is something we haven't said much about, but if you're going to hydrogenate material either for the H process or whatnot, you're going to have to have a hydrogen producing unit to obtain the hydrogen for the reaction. Catalyst regeneration. This is something we haven't said much about either. Difficulties involved are the solids separation techniques have to be improved. Catalysts have to be evaluated. Scale up to commercial size equipment is an important difficulty. The console process ran from 1967 to 1970 at Cresap, West Virginia, and has been closed down but may be opened again for an experimental plant. Vera Mines process, six tons per day pilot plant proposed. My understanding is that that's much out of date and that bigger plants are proposed at the present time. Just for fun to look at the difficulties, solid separation of unreacted coal is cited as one of them. Production of hydrogen for the process is very much the same as the H process. Scale up of the reactor to commercial size. The difficulties seem to be the same as those for the H process. At any rate, there is a good summary in here on page 728 of the status of all of the processes we've mentioned, as well as a couple of these solvent refining processes and the difficulties that are involved. Passing on down, the next item, the SRC project, is one that I have included in two places. We discussed it the other day in connection with the, the uh, paralysis of coal. It is the one that was originally developed with the Spencer Chemical Company and yields around 50% carbon 
with high sulfur content that has to be taken care of in some particular way and leads to a oil yield which several of them claim to be the order of three barrels per ton of coal in spite of all of the coal not being utilized. The fuel oil is not very well desulfurized. It contains 1.2% sulfur. But this, as I say, is material we went over before. Uh, next, I have listed this TRW Myers process, but I can just pass over by pointing out that it's concerned only with removing the iron priorities and the inorganic sulfur from coal using ferric sulfate, I think, as a medium for converting the iron into a soluble form and taking it out of the coal. The next item I want to mention is this BTX process. Perhaps some of you noticed this. It's rather recent vintage. Oil and Gas Journal of July 1974. I'm not sure what BTX stands for, but uh, it's the trade name for this. It comes out of the University of Utah. A man by the name of Quader, if there's no misprint, is one of the few Qs that doesn't have a U following. It's Q-A-D-E-R. The process, and again, I think I have a transparency for this. Oh, it's already here. The uh, process involves hydrogenation at a pressure of, I think, 200 atmospheres. The separating out and fractionating of the liquids, winding up with fuel oil, naphtha, and this material that they call BTX. Now, the intriguing part of this lies in the composition of the BTX material that's obtained. BTX product is the aromatic, aromatic product. It's 41% benzene, 15% toluene, and the rest is ethylbenzene and xylenes and so forth. And this amounts to a total of 33% on a weight basis of the coal with which one started. 33% on a weight basis. Now this is a very high yield. It's perhaps why the article is headlined, BTX can be produced for 25 cents per gallon from coal. Very valuable source of aromatics. But there's another interesting aspect of this. In this article by Weiser that I told you was in the series of papers given at the Libby Laboratories in September 1973, considerable attention is given to work that he's doing on the hydrogenating of anthracene. Anthracene and other groups of three or four aromatic or semi-aromatic rings with a view to noting what the products would be. Without bothering to write this in the board, you all realize that if you have an anthracene molecule, which is three rings in a row, and if you attack the center carbons, I think they call them the nine and 10 carbon in this molecule, you would stand a good chance of getting two benzene rings as a product. In other words, getting two benzenes out of a single anthracene. But this never happens. He's done very careful chromatographic work to show that the maximum you ever get is one benzene ring out of an anthracene. You tear the pieces of things off by pieces at the end to form other molecules, and you don't attack those particular carbons. You, you attack those on the end of the molecule and gradually work in, leaving simply one ring. This is also true if you start with four, you wind up with one benzene ring and no more than that. Well, if we consider anthracene, a uh, simple calculation would show that it has uh, six carbons in the one ring, and then you can count four in each of the next two, so that's 14 carbons. One benzene ring would represent a 40% yield on the rate of the, on the weight of the original benzene. If you count four rings in a row, you come up to 18 carbons, of which six would be for the benzene, so this would be a third. So if you're, what I'm trying to get at is that a yield of 33% by weight of benzene 
is very consistent with what you would expect if the average composition of the, uh, the cyclic members of the molecule that we showed here a day or so ago uh, is somewhere in the range of three to four. And if in the hydrocracking of these, in the hydrogenating of them by this process, you carry these molecules down to their ultimate destiny, the parts going to aromatics should never exceed about a third of the total weight. Now, whether there's any significance to this or not, I don't know, but it's, it's a rather interesting correlation that even this yield is not one in excess of what you might reasonably expect on the basis of the behavior of three and four unit rings when you do hydrogenate them over a catalyst to form ultimately benzene as one of the products. The other products include 15, 16 weight percent fuel oil, three weight percent naphtha, so that if you add all of those together, you come up with about a 52% conversion to liquid products. This is on the basis of the original coal weight. And the amount of char left is only 10% of the initial weight. So it is a process that bears looking into. Uh, I think this is done, I forgot to mention, this is done as a dry hydrogenation. The coal preparation does not involve slurring. This is a high velocity dropping of coal particles, passing of coal particles through a hot zone, and the products obtained here are, as I say, obtained uh, on the basis of this dry hydrogenation. Incidentally, there's a considerable amount of gas formed, the total gas amounting to 30% by weight, C1 to C4 gas. It contains not only 64% methane, but 25% ethane, some propane and some butane. So quite a suitable gas for natural gas purposes. All in all, though this doubtlessly is a small scale operation and doubtlessly is being publicized in the way that people like to publicize things when they're coming out new, uh, it struck me as having considerable merit and pointing in the direction that work can be done toward the dry hydrogenation as well as the solvent hydrogenation of coal to furnish various products. I think that's, oh, there's just one other item I want to mention. Uh, Mills in his articles on coal gasification, coal liquefaction, production of gasoline and so forth, makes an important point to the point of the fact that if one substitutes carbon monoxide for hydrogen so that the carbon monoxide water vapor pressure are equivalent to the pressure of hydrogen ordinarily used, one gets an enormous increase in the rate of hydrogenation of coal. He gives data in which, well, the lowest point shown on his curve is a 40% conversion for the regular coal hydrogenation. At that same point, there'd be 90% conversion if one used water vapor carbon monoxide. Now, I'm not sure this was written in July 1969, and it may be a forerunner of what the Bureau of Mines is now publicizing as their co-steam, CO, S-T-A-M, co-steam process in which they put in carbon monoxide up to three or 4,000 pounds per square inch. They do not put water in because the water of the coal itself is sufficient for the purpose. And out of this, they claim a process for hydrogenating coal that seems to be very effective. This reminds one a little bit of the process they are also working on for treating garbage, trash, cellulose, wood fibers. I think in the original articles, there was a particular point made of fact that cow manure could be included. Uh, converting this to oil by exposing it to carbon monoxide and the small amount of water that's in these materials at reasonable temperatures and pressures up to two or 3,000 PSI. Such a plant, incidentally, is being built at Albany, Oregon. I'm looking forward to watching its progress. I don't know that I'll have anything to do with it, but uh, I'll at least take a look at it once in a while as an experimental attempt to use trash, garbage, and so forth and so on in a productive way to produce oil. Uh, I think this is a good place to stop. We have a few minutes left yet. Are there some comments, corrections, or criticisms, or whatnot?
I wanted to uh, make two points, I believe. Uh, in the uh, synthoil process, according to Sid Akhtar, who is the engineer in charge now, the uh, basic objective of this process is to produce a low sulfur product. After even six or seven hundred hours of operation, the sulfur content has, uh, of the product has gone only from twelve hundredths to about nineteen hundredths of a percent and is still quite acceptable in that sense. The uh, viscosity has gone up to the point where uh, it has just about been the reason to cut off the process at that time. It, it's, it's a little hard to say because uh, there are normally scheduled uh, refurbishing times in that ha they have used and they haven't really tried for a longevity run as far as I know. Uh, the largest problem in the synthoil process that has been perceived by people I've talked with at Gulf and Exxon is that in scaling up to a sensible size, maintenance of turbulence, which seems to be crucial for keeping carbon and uh, mineral deposits on the external surface of the catalyst down to a minimum, that maintenance of turbulence will prove to be uh, probably uh, too difficult to make it a viable concept. Now, what their alternatives are in the private companies, they wouldn't tell me when I asked them. Uh, with regard to the uh, particle size question, uh, the intrinsic kinetics for hydro desulfurization are low enough so that at the normal space velocities used in reactors uh, in, for residuum desulfurization, uh, sixteenth inch uh, particles are almost fully effective. They're effective for uh, molecular weights up to about 4,000 typically. Eighth-inch particles tend to be not utilized on the inner surface. So I think that if the uh, processes occurring in the uh, uh, Como, with, with, this is Como and uh, 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 one per hour space velocity, about the same as the uh, uh, ebulated bed numbers, the, uh, I think one could get by with uh, full utilization of the catalyst even if it were larger than a sixteenth of an inch or almost full. That's all. Thank you very much for those comments. This is the type of information I hope somebody would have and that I hadn't obtained in detail. Are there any uh, other questions or comments? I think we're about ready to go off the tape, am I correct? Uh, well, it's a simple matter. If there are no more questions, if there are more questions, we might delay two minutes. We might delay long enough to uh, readjust the apparatus over here. Are there any more questions? I don't know to what extent people have been interested in any of this liquid phase work. It's obvious that uh, we have some information, but uh, and I'm also interested in the fact that these are critical comments from Gulf and from Exxon about the synthol process without any revelation of exactly how they're taking care of things or what their own processes are. I didn't say anything about the Gulf or the Exxon processes. I know they're working in the field. I personally haven't any knowledge at all as to the details of the processes they're working on. So I had to confine myself to the things that are in the literature. If there are no further questions, then I think we can call it off until 2 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs>